Hello and welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I am Mary Ann Collins King, your host for this evening's event. And tonight we have three amazing guests. Our first guest this evening is Andrea Shabaglian. She is the president and CEO of Made for Them. It's a locally owned organization in reference to working with human trafficking. The goal is to eradicate it. Also, we will have Cesar Lopez. He is from the Deported Veterans, and he has quite a, a story to share this evening. And then thirdly, we have the honor of having a conversation with George Rodanovich. George Rodanovich will share his strategic ways in which we can restore our state by means of incorporating a grassroots effort, which is called Restore California. Please stay tuned, and we will be speaking with Andrea soon. Everybody's got to be covered. This is an unrepublican thing for me to say. Universal health care. I am going to take care of everybody. Well, who pays for it? The government's going to pay for it. The government's going to pay for it. This tax would raise approximately $5.7 trillion. In many cases, I probably identify more as a Democrat. I hate the concept of guns. I'm not in favor of it. Why are you joining the Reform Party? I really believe the Republicans are just too crazy right. I mean, hey. I lived in New York City and Manhattan all my life, okay? So, you know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa, perhaps. Partial birth abortion. Would President Trump ban partial birth abortion? Well, look, I'm, I'm very pro-choice. But you would not ban it? No. Or ban partial birth abortion? No, I would. I am pro-choice in every respect. This is an unrepublican thing for me to say. Who do you think would be the best qualified to make a deal with Iran? Hillary's always surrounded herself with very good people. I think Hillary would do a good job. Make a deal with Iran. Well, I think Hillary would do a good job. Nancy Pelosi, the speaker. And I'm very impressed by her. I think she's a very impressive person. I like her a lot. She was going to really look to impeach Bush and get him out of office, which personally I think would have been a wonderful thing. Impeaching him? Well, I thought he did a great job tonight. I thought he was strong and smart, and it looks like we have somebody that knows what he's doing. And it's a strong guy who really knows what he wants. And this is what we need. Hillary's a great friend of mine. Uh, her husband is a great friend of mine. I think Hillary is going to take it. And I think Hillary is very, very capable. I'm, I'm very pro-choice. A liberal in health care. Universal health coverage. I love the universal. Nation. As far as single payer, it works in Canada. It works incredibly well in Scotland. It just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. Donald Trump and I both agree that there ought to be more taxation. What do you think of eminent domain? I think it's a wonderful thing. I'll be honest with you. For people that have been here for years, that have you know been hard workers, have good jobs, are supporting a family, it's very, very tough to just say, you have to leave, yeah. get out. How do you throw somebody out that's lived in this country for 20 years? Right, you just can't throw everybody out. He was basically a Democrat. And he was supportive of Democrats. He was supportive of a lot of the causes that, you know, I cared about and that people I knew cared about. tolerate these values in our children. Why would we want them in a president? I mean, hey, I lived in New York City and Manhattan all my life, okay? So, you know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa. They are different, like on abortion. Would President Trump 
ban partial birth abortion. Well, look, I am pro-choice in every respect. And what does Trump think about Iowa? How stupid are the people of Iowa? Donald Trump, New York values, not ours. You know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa. I'm Ted Cruz, and I approve this message. Hello, welcome back to Conservative Roundtable. I am Marianne Collins King, and on the phone this evening, we have the honor of having a conversation with Andrea Shabaglian. Andrea is the president of Made For Them, and the website is madeforthem.org. And so, Andrea, welcome to our show. Well, thank you for having me, and thanks to be here. Thanks for letting me call in. Wonderful. Why don't we go ahead and start by you telling us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll talk about the organization. Sure. Well, let's see. I, um, I think the first thing to know about me is I'm a mom of two young kids. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher is seven, and Tiffany is four. And I think that's sort of what you know really wraps my my world. And um, my husband's a worship pastor in Fresno, California. Right. So we're very very involved in the community and. Uh, you know, and passionate about things and, and getting involved in our community. Now, I understand that at one time you worked in events, and then as time has gone by, being a busy mom, busy wife, and also working with these events, there was a time in which you recognized that human trafficking, there's just no excuse for it. So between yourself and some other designers um, that you know in the area, you came up with the name of Made For Them, and please share with us how that journey unraveled. Yeah, so it made sure it really was an idea that I had for about eight years um, before it took off. But it was something, you know, I was probably had as much knowledge as the majority of most Americans now, maybe a little bit less. Cause now there's been a lot more attention given towards it. But um, it was very limited. Um, but what I did have an understanding of is that I had a freedom that there were people in this world did not have. Right. And so how, how you know, I'm a high creative, so I, I probably have a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit about myself. And so I um, really have this idea just of using fashion. I'm probably not the most fashionable person. You know, Marianne is always to the nine. So um, <laughs> I was not probably somebody you would sort of pinpoint to, to run a fashion organization or fashion line. So for me, it was really just a vehicle, a vehicle to raise um, awareness, tell the story, and financial resources to support it. I just, you know, it was really just juggling um, the idea of really wanting to make my life count and to um, not go through life having lived without trying to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a combination of just the weight of knowing, you know, the atrocities that happen on a daily basis, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, you know, outside of the U.S. and in our own backyard, and then choosing to or not to do something about it, you know, and I wanted to be the one that chose to do something about it, whether it's just for one or I felt sweat on my face, I can, I can, you know, at least say I tried right. to, to make a difference. So with that being said, human trafficking is just a horrific issue and problem in the city of Fresno. And with that being said, um, I realize that you have some pretty staggering statistics as far as what the rates are here. Would you share those with us, please? Sure. Well, I think what's important to know is that it is identified as the second largest international crime, as well as fastest growing. So um, you're going to see now a lot of um, massage parlors you know, pop up um, that are potential fronts for trafficking. Um, oftentimes it's hidden in plain sight, uh, whether it's domestic servitude, you know, the girls um, walking the streets. Um, gangs now are turning to it. You know, it's a lot more, more profitable to, mm -hmm. um, to turn over a, a girl multiple times a day than to sell a, a bag of this or a dime of that. And so a lot of... Um, different organizations are turning towards trafficking. So it is an epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, majority of what we see here, we do also have a street outreach. And so we do see a lot of the sexual exploitation um, here in our community. We are an ad community, so there is forced labor that has been identified. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the average age of entry 
for trafficking, even here in our, our own community, is 12 years old. Mm. So, um, you know, those are statistics from our, we have a, we're very fortunate, there's only nine vice units of the Human Trafficking Division in the state of California, mm -hmm. and Fresno County is, is lucky enough to have one, and we have a tremendous uh, local vice unit, um, and they, you know, they see these young girls in all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you um, for your, your service in reference to starting this grassroots effort in order to assist in eradicating human trafficking. Um, but getting back to the organization itself, Made for Them is an organization to where there's actual clothing that is created and designed for sale. And yes. um, beautiful pieces of clothing, as you know, I've purchased my fair share, and yes, thank um, you. <laughs> and and wear my my pieces proudly, Andrea. Um, yes. So with the revenue from the clothing line, that all goes towards the rehabilitation um, for individuals who are rehabbing from sex trafficking and human trafficking. So made for them itself is a two prong approach. We have yeah. the fashion side to where there's the revenue coming in, which goes towards the counseling side for those individuals who are rehabilitating. So would you say that's fair to say we've got the counseling and we have the fashion? Yeah, I think, um, you know, human trafficking is a really heavy cause. It's not easy to digest or to wrap mm -hmm. one's mind around it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, not everybody's going to take on this cause like I have, you know? Mm -hmm. And so fashion is really just a means to to get into really every every home, you know, mm -hmm. where maybe ignorance is bliss or it's just easier. It's, it's very overwhelming. How can we make a difference? How can we be a part of something? Mm -hmm. And so through the vehicle fashion, people can be actively engaged in it. Um, so one, yes. Currently, the resources go to provide uh, free counseling that we offer, individual and group therapy, and we're opening up other mm -hmm. areas as well. Um, we, we are in desperate need of a case manager, so we do need funds for a case manager. So there we go, um, case manager. If there's any case managers that are listening, or if anyone knows of a case manager that may be interested in working for this nonprofit. Want to sponsor a case manager. Right, right. Excellent. And then the future goal really is to um, to provide jobs. So we work with Welfare to Work, so we um, do work experience and job training programs as, as part of it. But, um, you know, we hope to have a small factory here, whether it's on the jewelry and accessory line or the apparel manufacturing line, uh, side of things. We do hope to provide jobs within our own organization, but if that's not where that we want to walk alongside these women and, and help them find their own voice, find their own dreams and desires, the likes and dislikes. So many of them know, you know, just give a first-hand opportunity to find out on the south and hold what it is. Excellent. And so, um, yeah, we hope to be job creators in our community mm -hmm. in a big way. Well, I have to say, um, I, I certainly appreciate your creative way um, and using your passion for taking care of others and using the fashion element to really assist in this grassroots effort. So Thank with you. that being said, talking about fashion, there is a huge event that will be taking place on Friday, February yes. 26th, and my understanding it is a sold out event. Yes, we are sold out. We um, are super excited. It's our third annual Fight with Fashion, and we are so excited about really is a community effort this event. We have a lot of local um, eateries, uh, restaurants and caterers and wineries who come and, and support uh, this night. And we have the we have creative arts, which is a silent auction, um, live dancing, uh, bands, um, and then of course, um, we are fortunate this year to have our Fresno County DA, Lisa Smith Camp. Um, we'll be sharing, you'll hear a very inspirational story of a survivor, Santaya Rose of ABC 30 is our host. And then, of course, we um, release our spring clothing line um, at the event. Exciting. Then, I can't shop, wait. Shop, shop. <laughs> we'll be shopping, definitely. Hey, yeah. So the name of the event is called Fight with Fashion, which is outstanding because that's really what it's about. We're here to fight against the bad folks um, to eradicate this horrific uh, endeavor, what they call human trafficking. So there's also um, another event during the year. It's called Art of Freedom. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that? 
Yes, we love Art of Freedom. We actually have um, Art of Freedom Fresno and Art of Freedom Sacramento. So, so, so what Sacramento. is it exactly, to explain to our viewers, what is Art of Freedom? Yep. So um, Art of Freedom is a hands-on art experience. It is a lot of fun. So guests are given a blank canvas, and we have this art bar full of an array of assorted artistic materials. And you, we kind of tell the story of how, you know, when survivors are first rescued, oftentimes they're given a blank canvas to try to recreate their life, like I mentioned earlier. Some mm-hmm. of them have never been given the opportunity to make decisions for themselves. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of correlate through the artistic um, process. And you might have this great idea of this is your color palette, and you go to use it, and then the green you chose is not how you saw that happening or it didn't turn out the way you wanted. And so how do you deal with that? You know, the same thing in life. You know, you think something's going to happen one way and it doesn't. And how do you process right. that? Do you, do you paint over it? Do you just stop working on it altogether and give up? Um, you know, do you throw some glitter on it and just make it look pretty? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how do you process those kinds of things? And so mm-hmm. we just kind of tell that story through through the process of art. And then guests get to take home their masterpiece. Wonderful. Um, and so we've heard so many wonderful stories that have re-inspired artists and um, or people who've never thought that they could do anything that they hang on their wall. They now hang, you know, their pieces from every year in their kitchen. And so we're, we're really neat stories like that. It's Excellent. Great event. So, Andrea, how can someone become involved to be a volunteer or to uh, attend one of the upcoming events? Yeah, so you can go to our website, madeforthem.org. Mm-hmm. Um, those are two major events. But we do have training throughout the year. I would say the two areas where we really um, would appreciate volunteers is through our Mercy Street Outreach, which is a partnership with law enforcement. Mm-hmm. It's just a once-a-month commitment. And, um, you know, it's a faith-based outreach. And so we have the opportunity to tell women that Jesus has not forgotten them. He loves them. He has a plan and a hope and a purpose for them. And we get to pray with them, offer them resources, and, and even an opportunity to walk off the streets at night if they were willing. Oh, excellent. So that's one way is building a Mercy Street team or, or joining one. And the other one is, you know, we need to build our um, mentor program. You know, uh, mm-hmm. the women need um, mentors. And so if anybody is interested in being a mentor, mm-hmm. um, you know, give us a call and we can and get you on that list. Excellent. Well, Andrea. Or you can also financially support us, either monthly or one time gift. You know, we do need um, financial resources to continue to provide the free services that we do. Yes. Well, being that it is a, a nonprofit 501c3, not only will you have an opportunity to donate money towards the efforts, but it's also a tax write off. So um, that's really what it comes down to for some folks. But you know what? It's really about the heart. It's really about helping others. It's compassion. And it's about community. So Andrea Shabagland, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you for the visit. Thank you, Marianne, for having me. Take care. Thanks. Good night.
got the top action figure. No way, it's he. What does he do? He pretends to be a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> I like bailouts for the banks. Too big to fail. I gave money to Pelosi, Reed, and Anthony Weiner. <laughs> hey, Hillary. I'll give you money to be my friend. Check out my house, Mr. Trump. That's a lousy house. I'm going to take your house with eminent domain and park my limos there. Eminent domain! We wouldn't tolerate these values in our children. Why would we want them in a president? I mean, hey, I lived in New York City and Manhattan all my life, okay? So, you know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa. They are different, like on abortion. Would President Trump ban partial birth abortion? Well, look, I am pro-choice in every respect. And what does Trump think about Iowa? How stupid are the people of Iowa? Donald Trump, New York values, not ours. You know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa. I'm Ted Cruz, and I approve this message. mainstream media covers immigration, it doesn't often see it as an economic issue. But I can tell you, it is a very personal economic issue. And I will say the politics of it would be very, very different if a bunch of lawyers or bankers were crossing the Rio Grande. Or if a bunch of people with journalism degrees were coming over and driving down the wages in the press. Then we would see stories about the economic calamity that is befalling our nation. If I'm elected president, we will triple the border patrol. We will build a wall that works. We will secure the border. I'm Ted Cruz, and I approve this message. Everybody's got to be covered. This is an unrepublican thing for me to say. Universal health care. I am going to take care of everybody. Well, who pays for it? The government's going to pay for it. The government's going to pay for it. This tax would raise approximately $5.7 In many cases, I probably identify more as a Democrat. I hate the concept of guns. I'm not in favor of it. Why are you joining the Reform Party? I really believe the Republicans are just too crazy right. I mean, hey. I lived in New York City and Manhattan all my life, okay? So, you know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa, perhaps. Partial birth abortion. Would President Trump ban partial birth abortion? Well, look, I'm, I'm very... Welcome back to Conservative Roundtable. Marianne Collins-King, your host this evening. And now we have the opportunity to have a conversation with Cesar Lopez. Hello, Cesar. How are you this evening? I'm doing great. Thank I'm you doing for great. having me. Thank you for very having me. Very good. You. And Cesar is from Deported Veterans. Is that correct? That's correct, Miss. Very good. Cesar, I understand you have a story to share with us this evening. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I've been, uh, I've been uh, starting, uh, to, starting talk to talk about Deported Veterans. Deported veterans. My name is Cesar Lopez. Cesar Lopez. Um, um, I'm a U.S. Marine. I was. Uh, I served in 1993 to 1995. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and uh, I got deported in 2012 for uh, a crime I committed in in the year 2000. I had a possession of marijuana, which I, under the under the advice of my lawyer, I pleaded guilty to it, and uh, and uh, I got a one year to first sentence out of that. off my record. I lived in my life normal for Uh, it didn't matter. Anything it didn't matter. Anything that I did, that I did after, after afterwards, 
to fix the problems that I had when I was a young man, mm -hmm. it didn't matter. It, it deported me. The judge never saw any of the letters that I had. Mm -hmm. Every time I never had a fair shot at giving my 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 story to a judge um, that I had uh, committed mistakes like a lot in in life, but I corrected those mistakes and it didn't matter. I ended up being deported and here I am. I was hiding for three and all trying to bring awareness to the issue. Well, the next step that I find is that uh, people don't know about this to a lot of people all over the, the city, all over the country. Well, I'm not going to say all over the country, California, Arizona, and uh, here in Nevada. That's the only places that I, I managed to get the courage to go out. And I used to travel all over the country when I was, when I was uh, recognized as a human being. But now I stay within these states because I'm safe. All my family's here or relatively safe. Um, and uh, I find that nobody knows. Everybody, they, they can't believe that I tell them. I started working at a company that I'm at right now. And my I told my boss what happened to me. And he couldn't believe it. And I asked him, I'm like, do I still have a job? Because now I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an illegal person. And uh, him being a veteran himself, he just, he shook his head and he like, no, man, you have a job as long as you need it. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to raise awareness by contacting um, um, congressmen and senators and making them aware of the problem and, and also starting to go to churches, organizations, small roots, uh, grassroots up. Everybody's trying, starting to find out a lot of people are Miss Bell, USMC. Thank you very much for having me. Also, I just want to point out that there, I'm not the only one. There's a estimate, I, I think it's like in the low hundreds, the amount of veterans, but we don't know. We don't know. It's like a state secret. Nobody knows how many deported veterans there are. I'm in direct contact with two ten of them in three different countries. Thank you very much, Ms. I appreciate it. Pretends to be a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> I like bailouts for the banks. Too big to fail. I gave money to Pelosi, Reed, and Anthony Weiner. <laughs> hey, Hillary. I'll give you money to be my friend. Check out my house, Mr. Trump. That's a lousy house. I'm gonna take your house with eminent domain and park my limos there. Eminent domain. <laughs> We wouldn't tolerate these values in our children. Why would we want them in a president?
I mean, hey, I lived in New York City and Manhattan all my life, okay? So, you know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa. They are different, like on abortion. Would President Trump ban partial birth abortion? Well, look, I am pro-choice in every respect. And what does Trump think about Iowa? How stupid are the people of Iowa? Donald Trump, New York values, not ours. You know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa. I'm Ted Cruz, and I approve this message. Look, I got the Trump action figure. No way, it's he. What does he do? He pretends to be a Republican. <laughs> I like bailouts for the banks. Too big to fail. I gave money to Pelosi, Reed, and Anthony Weiner. <laughs> hey, Hillary. I'll give you money to be my friend. Check out my house, Mr. Trump. That's a lousy house. I'm going to take your house with eminent domain and park my limos there. Eminent domain! We wouldn't tolerate these values in our children. Why would we want them in a president? I mean, hey, I lived in New York City and Manhattan all my life, okay? So, you know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa. They are different, like on abortion. Would President Trump ban partial birth abortion? Well, look, I am pro-choice in every respect. And what does Trump think about Iowa? How stupid are the people of Iowa? Donald Trump, New York values, not ours. You know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa. I'm Ted Cruz, and I approve this message. tolerate these values in our children. Why would we want them in a president? Hi, welcome back to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Marianne Collins King, your host, and on on phone this evening, we have George Rodonovich. Hello, George. Hey, Marianne. Good evening. George Rodonovich uh, represented California's 19th district as U.S. Congressman from 1995 to 2011. Prior to that, he served as Mariposa uh, Planning Commission and on the Board of Supervisors. Currently, he is leading the cause of a nonprofit called the Four Institutions and Restore California. So, George, would you please share with us a little bit more about what the four institutions is in addition to what Restore California is in reference to moving California along? Oh, I'd be happy to, Marianne. And really, I, you know, I, I made Restore California for people that are, you know, at this point in time just really fed up with the way government works right now. And don't really see a, a lot of hope, but don't have a lot of hope in in uh, what's out there right now in the current madness. And and uh, what Restore California does relies on the private sector to start initiating changes in our communities. Um, and by doing that, it builds grassroots uh, support for change and offers a way for America, a plausible way, mm -hmm. to get back to conservative values. Mm -hmm. Doesn't take um, 
you know, an election cycle. It takes more than that. It takes a generation. But if people are really fed up with not being satisfied with Washington, I offer this as a real alternative. Excellent. So in reference to the four institutions, and, and I really like um, the four institutions in reference to the pillars of the institutions, a pillar of faith, family, work, and government, because that in itself um, is a structure that needs to be strong. So um, based upon these particular pillars or institutions, it, it sounds as if uh, the family unit at this point in time is the weakest. And, and that's exactly right. Um, the four institution refers to um, things that, that are important in our society. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they basically boil down to four things. I call them the way that we pursue happiness. It's in worshiping God, loving our neighbor as ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, raising a family and working. And so it's our job, I think, in our culture and in our politics, mm -hmm. is to make sure the institutions support those mm -hmm. are strong. And the weakest of those four is the family. And uh, what Restore California does is that it draws community together, it draws communities together and gives them um, a goal, and that is to reduce fatherlessness, unwed pregnancy, divorce, and family violence by 30% in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's been done before. It's been done in Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, with a group called First Things First that, that began this in 1995 and actually succeeded. And I believe that if together in California we can get every community to set these goals and work persuasively, not mm -hmm. legally, uh, to achieve them, then we we save dramatically on the cost of incarceration, uh, police, education, health care, you name it. I mean, it, it, you know, these issues are the common denominator of all the issues that drive up the cost of government. So right. it's been our failure, I think, to focus on the real issues, I think, in this country that has caused the problems that we have today, and, and uh, this is where California is to change. Right. And, and the key there as well is the fact that um, these principles and this structure is to be implemented with no government assistance. Is that correct? That is the goal? Yes. You know, it's amazingly uh, uh, an application of conservative values, and that is that conservatives hold uh, the private sector in high esteem. And what this project does is it engages the private sector and said, let's get together and reduce these indicators. We can do it without government assistance, which has already proven to happen in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Let's just put it on a statewide basis. And uh, and it's all through persuasion. It's non-condemnational. It's, uh, it's, it's all done by just, you know, kind of right, keeping the information out there, raising the standard, and encouraging people to um, take seriously uh, their family lives more seriously and uh, and focus on the kids that uh, come into this world. So it's all, all by persuasion, and it's really it, it's an amazing conservative way to bring about conservatism. And by the way, it also will attract Democrats and uh, Hispanics back into the conservative move movement. If, if we take on the mantle of the fatherless child in this way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, in reference to fatherlessness, unwed pregnancy, <clears throat> and, and divorce, uh, these three areas in which um, is going to be worked upon, what would really be the, the, the main, um, you can say, uh, the conversation that one would have with a particular entity that would like to partner with Restore California. For example, um, I understand that you're partnering with EOC, which is one of the um, local nonprofits in our area, and that's an opportunity for them uh, to share the information as far as grassroots, uh, the, the foundations within the home. So um, yeah, and, what, would be really, a um, what would be a common conversation um, one would have with these organizations about the fatherlessness, the unwed pregnancies, and the divorce rate? Well, let me, let me explain it in this way. What I look for in communities when I'm spreading the word of this movement is I try to look for uh, and develop core groups within counties, within okay. communities. In Fresno, this 
core group would consist of people in business, religious, the religious community, nonprofits, mm-hmm. um, law enforcement, and schools. And if we can develop a small core group around that, mm-hmm. then the goal is to be able to implement, but also endorse the number of programs that exist out there already toward a community-wide goal, a high, high, visit, high visibility community-wide goal of reducing these indicators. So say, for example, um, uh, Fresno County, uh, people give in Fresno County to the tune of about $323 million a year. That's the churches and nonprofits. Mm-hmm. The amount that they uh, they take credit for on their taxes for deductions, mm-hmm. and the whole idea of restore Fresno County would be to take those three hundred and twenty three uh, million dollars and their donors and educate them and say, you know what, we're going to make this county better in huge ways if we just focus our giving to reduce these indicators, reduce fatherlessness, unwed pregnancy, and divorce and family violence by 30% in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so let's encourage donors to give to those that begin to think about, okay, who who are the organizations whose work contributes to those goals? And let's let's establish a priority where those those groups that do that receive uh, funding and full funding in order to be able to carry out their mission. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is trying to change the hearts and minds of the donors Mm -hmm that will empower the private sector to take care of these problems, and then teach edu- elected officials to become advocates of this system so that we begin to even actually think that we could reduce the cost of government based on the success of these local private initiatives that end up reducing the cost of uh, education, law enforcement, um, uh incarceration and such. So what we're trying to do is, is establish and achieve conservative principles uh, by reducing the need for government services mm-hmm. as we're carrying out these conver- uh, conservative principles within the private sector. Excellent. So with that being said, um, let's focus now on the four institutions and perhaps um, let's talk a little bit about uh, a book that you've published, which I did bring with me. I have my copy. It's uh, yep. The New World Order of uh, the Old World Order. Uh-huh. So, George, would you like to talk a little bit about the book, its contents, and, and what we can learn and derive from it? Yes. I, you know, the, 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 the title of the book is, is, is um, in some ways, makes people think that this is some Masonic ideal or anything, but, but mm-hmm. truly, I think in, if you look at the way history develops, we're heading toward what most believers, I think, and a lot of Christians would believe, is mm-hmm. that we're headed back to the, to the Garden of Eden, where, you know, there's, there's going to be few and simple ways in which we communicate or, or live uh, in the presence of God, and that is through <clears throat> worshiping God, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, raising a family and working, and those are the four things that uh, that one of these days we're going to be doing perfectly well. Mm-hmm. And it's our charge, I think, as human beings in this present day imperfect world, to make these institutions just as strong as they can be. And so, the old world order that I talk about is the old world order that's not working, and that's why there's so much frustration mm-hmm. with this over reliance on government, and the whole system seems to be getting worse and worse. The new world order, which is really the old world order, is what we ought to be striving for altogether, and that is mm-hmm. a minimalist government. But in in addition to that, we have uh, strong families. We have institutions that uh, uh, really do well in loving our neighbor as ourselves, and these private sector institutions have to be strong in order for us to be able to achieve this goal of, of, of uh, less government, and that's what conservatives need to hear right now. Right, exactly. So um, we touched on the institution of faith, institution of family. Let's, uh, let's focus a little bit more on institution of work, that particular um, portion in the book, and um, in reference to that, when I think of work, I think of, in my mind, I think of job creation and, and how we can um, work in order to serve others 
which is very similar to a Judeo-Christian belief set. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I do know that in uh, American history, one thing that Americans have gotten down very, very well is work. Mm -hmm. uh, in our free inter enterprise system, <laughs> the free market system, mm -hmm. very important to the success of America. That's one thing that, you know, you can talk about government, uh, increased government regulations and uh, interference within, the, within um, uh, free market capitalism. And I get that. There's a lot of that. But that is, on, on general, one of the institutions that we've managed to do pretty well. But I think when people talk about the success of America, they look at indicators like the gross national product. They look at the, the uh, stock markets and what the index is that particular day. But what they fail to see is that the private sector consists of so much more than just business. Mm -hmm. It also is the health of the family unit. You know, the way uh, uh, families are together, because when a child is, is has a good relationship with his biological or adoptive parents, that child is more able to succeed in life and become less of a burden on government. Mm -hmm. And also in nonprofits, you know, in, the, in that private sector where, uh, I, which I label under loving our neighbors ourselves, you know, there's certain things that we, that we, um, certain certain part of our duties that we give to the government, which is a soul-stealing agency, uh, that we need to improve on. So in my mind, we've done really well on business, mm -hmm. but what we've what really, what we've really lacked in doing is, is, um, is in the family institutions and in that area of loving, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And Those are the ones we need to strengthen. Yes, I, I agree with you. And, and <clears throat> my thinking is that perhaps what it comes down to is, is fairly fundamental and foundational, that yeah. it all begins in the home. And I recognize and am sensitive to um, every home is quite different. You know, there could be a mother, father, uh, extended family, single parent, or what have you. But what it comes down to is that we as American citizens need to take responsibility as far as what our home life is and be responsible for recognizing we have children in the home. Um, it's very important to have very close interpersonal relationships um, to where that is valued, to where we can take these particular foundations and fundamentals of having, you know, happy might be a label of sort, but having a healthy relationship within the family because when there is a healthy relationship in the family, and when there is a lead, uh, for example, many times it would be the father, that is very helpful for a child's uh, development as they grow uh, throughout their educational years, um, as they're empowered by their parents, and they'll become uh, contributing citizens to the community. Um, you're exactly right, and it's not just your opinion, Marianne. It's based, uh, it's backed up by the facts. If people go to my website, which is RestoreCalifornia123.com. You can, uh, you'll find an item there you can click on to uh, for Restore California. And it does give you the statistics about um, broken homes. And, and, and again, we're not going against anybody, but we're stating the facts and we're looking for ways, positive ways, mm -hmm. in the private sector to improve this. But you'll, if you go through the statistics, that is that uh, those that have, that are the, have the benefit of their biological or adoptive parents in the home, mm -hmm. dedicated to raising them, then they turn out better than those that don't. And mm -hmm. so, the simple thing is: is let's let's increase the number, if we can, through persuasion, not by law changes, uh, of those people that are committed to their kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, and once you do that, the whole dynamic in this country really does change. I agree. And I think a lot of it does come down to a transformation of, of hearts, so to speak, um, yeah. and for our elected officials rather than, like you indicated, the G GNP, the gross national product. Numbers are important, but what's more important is the body, mind, spirit of each individual, specifically in one's household. Yeah. And, and, and so our country doesn't function well unless our free markets work well, unless our families work well, unless our 
the giving aspect, the love our neighbor as ourselves aspect of our private community mm -hmm. works well, then we have a free country. But mm -hmm. you can't expect, you know, to, to be a Republican and a conservative and think that you're going to elect the right people to Washington and allow them to pass laws to make all this work. It's just not going to happen. Right, so, right. But by nature, it won't happen. Right, exactly. So let's start focusing on what will. Very and, good. Uh, you know, and then that will initiate the change that we're all looking for. Right. Very good. Well, we certainly appreciate um, this amazing book. Again, it's uh, New World Order of the Old World Order, Restore California, Four Institutions, all very important. And uh, one more thing I wanted to touch on briefly before we close, George. You're also a vintner. You have a winery in Mariposa. And... Um, I'll have to say, um, I certainly appreciate it, and I'm sure quite a few people who purchase your wine, specifically, what, Thousand Vines? Is, is that the name of it? One Thousand Vines, One Thousand yeah. Vines. Um, people appreciate the fact that you also have that creative side. Would you share with us a yeah, little bit? And, and uh, thank you for, for bringing that up. You can go to my website, a thousandvines.com. Mm -hmm. I, I produce some wine. Uh, in, uh, when I came back from Congress, I had an old abandoned vineyard mm -hmm. that I reestablished myself. I retrellised and mm -hmm. <laughs> excuse me, retrained it, and mm -hmm. and uh, the wine is a, 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 a Sauvignon Blanc from 30-year-old vines. I'm sold out of the 2014 crop, but the 2015 crop is is going to be available in about a month, month and a half, so people can taste that. But it's gotten very good reviews and. I think Mariposa is turning out to be uh, a really uh, could be a very reputable wine area here in the near future. So I think people will enjoy the wines. That's fantastic. Well, I'm going to read um, a very uh, short excerpt from your website about the wine. It, it states here, uh, grape growing in 1982, four years later, that's when you did start uh, the winery. And it's the region's first winery producing the first wine from Mariposa County since the Prohibition. Uh, many people probably weren't, are not aware of that. In addition, when um, you were elected to Congress in 1994, you were the first winemaker to serve in Congress since Thomas Jefferson. So yes. the first winemaker, that's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> so you have your, your creative side and... Um, you know, for me, you know, I'm a spiritual person, a uh, Christian, so water, wine, I call it the Jesus juice. So right <laughs> we appreciate that. So, George, with that being said, again, thank you for all your amazing efforts uh, to work with the community, to help others, to help families, and also to restore California. Thank uh, you. Marianne, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be on your show. It's a great show. Great. And uh, hope to be on sometime in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much, and God bless you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Everybody's got to be covered. This is an unrepublican thing for me to say. Universal health care. I am going to take care of everybody. Well, who pays for it? The government's going to pay for The government's going to pay for This tax would raise approximately $5.7 In many cases, I probably identify more as a Democrat. I hate the concept of guns. I'm not in favor of it. Why are you joining the Reform Party? I really believe the Republicans are just too crazy right. I mean, hey. I lived in New York City and Manhattan all my life, okay? So, you know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa, perhaps. Partial birth abortion. Would President Trump ban partial birth abortion? Well, look, I'm, I'm very pro-choice. But you would not ban it? No. Or ban partial birth abortion? No, I would. I am pro-choice in every respect. This is an unrepublican thing for me to say. Who do you think would be the best qualified to make a deal with Iran? Hillary's always surrounded herself with very good people. I think Hillary would do a good job. Make a deal with Iran. Well, I think Hillary would do a good job. Nancy Pelosi, the speaker. And I'm very impressed by her. I think she's a very impressive person. I like her a lot. She was going to really look to impeach Bush and get him out of office, which personally I think would have been a wonderful thing. They're impeaching him? Well, I thought he did a great job tonight. I thought he was strong and smart, and it looks like we have somebody that knows what he's doing. And it's a strong guy who really knows what he wants. And 
This is what we need. Hillary's a great friend of mine. Uh, her husband is a great friend of mine. I think Hillary is going to take it. And I think Hillary is very, very capable. I'm, I'm very pro-choice. A liberal on health care. Universal health coverage. I like universal. As far as single payer, it works in Canada. It works incredibly well in Scotland. It just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. Donald Trump and I both agree that there ought to be more taxation. What do you think of eminent domain? I think it's a wonderful thing. I'll be honest with you. For people that have been here for years, that have you know been hard workers, have good jobs, are supporting a family, it's very, very tough to just say, you have to leave, yeah. get out. How do you throw somebody out that's lived in this country for 20 years? Right, you just can't throw everybody out. He was basically a Democrat. And he was supportive of Democrats. He was supportive of a lot of the causes that, you know, I cared about and that people I knew cared about.